I'll get over a hundred different bucks on camera on public land every year that's like 120 or better. Wait, a hundred total or a hundred over 120? No, 100 over 120. Oh, I don't mess with anything oh, under that. Smokes. In yeah. the Ozarks. In the Ozarks. They hear that thump. That's like a dinner bell. Mm -hmm. Ding, ding. I'm <laughs> going for it. Dude, I'm so in for this strategy. And I like backpedaled and I went. <laughs> <laughs> what? And, and whatever it was ran away. I didn't know what it was. I went. <laughs> <laughs> We are joined tonight by our guest, Rustin Johnson of United Outdoors, Branch Boss, yeah, Fireside. Fireside. <laughs> a lot of different things. Law of Doctor. Law school. Uh, yeah, yeah. Everything. Um, and uh, New father. <laughs> that's right. New baby. Um, and and Rustin, you are just absolutely a big buck killer. Um, you've you kind of made that name for yourself. And we know you know what you're doing in the Whitetail Woods. And so... Thanks for coming over to my house. and uh, Oh, yeah. It's good to be here. Thanks for hanging out with us talking early season whitetail. Yeah. I'm glad to be known as a big buck killer because my dad's usually the the one that gets that title. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. we talked to – so we talked to your dad last year. Yeah. Uh, early September as well. And um, yeah. so it only felt right to have Rustin yeah, on. Yeah, so this is your Absolutely. chance to trump your dad and in information, <laughs> stories, Oh, you better believe you know, whatever it. You I want to try to. <laughs> yeah. Um, so – we always like to start with just kind of an intro and, and, and who you are, where'd you grow up. Um, so tell me, tell me just a little bit about yourself. Okay. So, uh, my name is Rustin Johnson. Um, uh, I've been in school for the past, ever since I was in kindergarten, I just graduated <laughs> law school. So it's been a haul. Yeah. Um, 26 years old, uh, grew up right here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, my dad grew up in South Arkansas, but, we moved up here when I was a year old, so my entire growing up has been right here, uh, Rogers area, so about middle of Northwest Arkansas. Yeah. Northwest Arkansas is my home. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, growing up, uh, I mean, I've, I've been shooting a bow since I was three years old uh, and killed my first deer with a bow when I was, I think, nine or ten. Okay. Uh, pulling back 40, 45, 50 pounds. And because I'm a big old boy, <laughs> always have been. Uh, and then I've, I mean, I've been killing deer with a bow ever since. Yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. What that, that first year that you got to go hunting, was it the first year you killed a deer or had you been hunting a couple no, of years? No. So I, he took me uh, with a gun. I think I killed my first one when I was seven or eight. Okay. Uh, with a 30 out six. And uh, I'm just fired up. Uh, that's actually on video. Uh, my first hunt ever. When you were seven? Uh, yes. My grandpa was uh, videoing us uh, over the shoulder, and I was sitting in my dad's lap, and I I killed a doe come uh, walking in in the morning. He had to sit in his lap because that 30 6 was going to knock you <laughs> on your butt. Yeah. So I was sitting in his lap, and uh, uh, I was snoring, uh, li little old chubby <laughs> kid, and uh, uh, there was mosquitoes that were landing on my face oh, about no. every every five minutes. So my dad would slap me, and I'd wake up, and and I, I was so tired because he, he gets out there, you know, like <laughs> early, early, yeah, yeah, and yeah. He, he didn't do anything different for me <laughs> in the youth season. So uh, he, he'd slap me every about five minutes, and then uh, one slap, I, I looked up at him, and he said, there's a deer. And I I got so excited and just shaking like a leaf, you know. <laughs> and uh, I didn't care what deer it was, it, but it was a, is probably a one year old doe. And she comes strolling through, and <laughs> nice I, tender meat. Yeah, I threw that gun up, boy. Oh, ever since that moment, I've just been hooked. Yeah, there's there's actually a, I need to get it digitized, but there's a VHS of that whole hunt, and uh, I'm dragging the deer out with my dad. And I look up to the camera and I said, I love the outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Yes. Yeah. Epic. And that's that like rich. almost been two decades ago. <laughs> but they, they've been filming their hunts for a long time. They've got stuff from back in the 
uh, early 2000s, maybe even 1990s on big VHS uh, camcorders. That needs to be um, your catchphrase. Anytime you shoot a big buck, I love you look, the outdoors. <laughs> you yeah. look straight at the camera and say, <laughs> "I love the outdoors." Uh, but yeah, I've been. I've. I mean, if anybody was gonna be a deer hunter, I I had no chance to be anything else. Yeah, my dad is uh, just absolutely obsessed with it. At one point, he had a bass boat and a bunch of hunting equipment, and my mom said, "You got to pick one or the other," and mm-hmm. he said. All right, selling the boat. Done. We're, <laughs> hey, done deal. Man. Nothing beats a white tail. We were talking before we started recording just about your dad. I remember talking to him last year, and he just had this look in his eye like nobody I've ever talked to before about deer. Gets in the zone. He is like in the zone. It's all he thinks about during hunting season. Yes. And uh, I can see how that would trickle down to you as like, I love doing <laughs> yeah. this. Yeah, I'm I'm obsessed. There's, there's all kinds of pictures of me uh, – like in my underwear on the in the living room floor, looking through Buckmasters magazines mm-hmm. and uh, looking at those old real tree monster buck videos, and I, I mean I've just been bred up with it. And then my my grandpa and my dad have been official scorers for um, over twenty years, or well, I guess it's thirty years now almost. And uh, I'm also an official scorer for Buckmasters, uh, so all three of us are official. Uh, my dad's Pope and Young, uh, Long Hunter Society and Buckmasters, and my grandpa's uh, Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young and um, and Buckmasters. So anytime someone around kills a big buck, I, I've been around it, yeah, and and been in the lifestyle, and that that could have desensitized me a little bit to like what a good buck is in the region. Right. Cause if someone kills a 120 around here, I mean that's a that's a significant buck. Yeah. But I've been used to like big bucks coming, yeah. coming in and out of the house all the time. Because they're so. y'all are the people they call. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That anytime anytime there's a there's a special deer we get a call. So uh I've just been uh born and raised with deer in my blood. Heck yeah, man. Yeah. So talk to me about um, United Outdoors and kind of, you know, taking taking something that you love to do as a hobby and, and turning it into more of like, um, you know, outdoor media creator, you know, doing advertisements and sponsorships and yeah. how that all kind of evolved into Fireside and Branch Boss. Kind of walk me through that. So it was all kind of a natural progression. Um, I kind of started uh, just sharing my experiences on my personal Instagram page uh back in the good old days when instagram could, you could really you know reach some people uh it wasn't so much a pay to play uh kind of atmosphere sure uh but i was putting out some decent content and people were really liking it and uh so i decided to uh do something with it because i was going to do it anyways uh whether or not i was getting anything out of it because i just i love it so much so uh we decided to make our own uh, little team, I guess you could say. And uh, it actually started off with the name Whitetail Warfare, Mm -hmm. which (laughs) it's a little little aggressive. Hardcore. A little aggressive. Uh, I wasn't thinking long-term on, like, you know, uh, relationships with different companies. It's hard to sell that in Walmart. Yeah. (laughs) The public perception of Uh that. I still like it, man. I think it's a great name. Yeah, or walking up, uh, asking permission at at a place at a non-hunter. Hey, I'm with Whitetail Warfare. (laughs) Uh, Which that, it wasn't waging war on whitetails. It was more of the the mental war inside yourself uh, because that's what I love about whitetail hunting. But it's kind of hard to sell that and explain that every time sure. that you talk to somebody. So uh, we decided to change the name to United Outdoors. Uh, actually, that second year of Whitetail Warfare uh, is when I met Dalton, which is my best friend by far. Um, and uh, he brought me over to his house one night, and we slammed – Two, three cases of beer. <laughs> and, Polished them off. Yeah, on X waypoint started dropping, and we so we just became super good buddies, and uh, that developed into a a marketing position for him, kind of taking control of uh, where we wanted to go with different companies, because I really wanted to be in control of all the creative aspects and the 
um, you know, gear aspects and stuff, but I didn't really want to have to juggle all the business side. And Dalton is a, a very good businessman. Uh, he manages uh, two plumbing companies, and they do very well. And uh, he is also in control of all the business stuff with um, United. Uh, me, my dad, and Dalton are all equal partners on United. Been really blessed to partner with some really good companies that we believe in and uh, that we love to work with. Uh, Onyx, Elite, uh, First Light, Wild Game, uh, Stealth Cam, uh, just to name a few. Um, and uh, United has always kind of been just my marketing kind of um, outdoor media space. Sure. And uh, really just to allow me to do what I was going to do already, uh, but like be able to give me the cameras I need or the bows to shoot and things like that for, for me to keep going in the direction that I want. Um, and then I've, I've kind of stumbled upon a, a kind of a magic product. If I, if I could say magic, I uh, mean, just to kind of let people know, I'm, if, if you don't already go check United out on, on Instagram, yeah. And and I think what you're about to talk about is branch behind. Yeah, right? so so United Instagram is our biggest platform. We also have YouTube, uh, which has actually ramped up significantly since uh, I've dropped a couple of videos, which I also do all the video editing and everything, uh, and run all the social pages for that. Um, but uh, we also have uh, Branch Boss, which is uh, which is actually me. Uh, because I, I'm kind of a experimenter in the whitetail woods. Um, uh, I think outside of the box a lot on a lot of things. And, uh, one of my favorite things to do is run trail cameras. And, uh, I've gotten really, really, really good at running trail cameras. Like I'll get over a hundred different bucks on camera on public land every year. That's like 120 or better. Whoa. There people don't Wait, even think they a hundred total or a hundred over 120. No, a hundred over one twenty. Oh, I don't mess with anything under these smokes. Yeah, oh. I don't. <laughs> I, That's I, a big number. Yeah, you, well, anything under one twenty, it'd be hard to keep them. You know, oh, keep no, them I, apart. Yeah, no, I wasn't saying the like the one twenty score. I was saying a hundred pictures of a hundred and twenty. Oh no, a, a hundred a hundred different bucks over a hundred and twenty inches on. All the public around here Jeez. in, in yeah. the Ozarks. In the Ozarks. So set, kind of. That's not even including Kansas. Yeah. which That that's a wormhole in itself. Sure. We'll talk through that score though for people who kind of don't know. Like, where does a 120 class deer fall on the scale for the Ozarks? So 120 class deer is like your stereotypical like super good Ozark buck. That's like a mature buck. That's a mature buck. Most likely he's going to be at least three, probably four years old. And that deer is um, not just every deer running out there. Mm -hmm. You could hunt for a week and not see one. Like 120-inch deer in the Ozark, especially on public land, is, is well, I want to say rare, but <laughs> for you, yeah. not so much. But hard to come by for yeah, most for the average it's, hunter. It's probably no, and it, and it's a it's a it's a definitely a task if you if you're successful in harvesting one of those. Uh, and a lot of people think that there's not many out there. They're just extremely elusive. Mm. And I've learned that they are out there mm -hmm. uh, partially by using my product that I've developed uh, to get them on camera. Because a lot of times you can put a camera out there. But if it's not in the exact spot that that buck's going to walk, then you don't even know that he was there. Mm -hmm. uh, my product gets them in front of your camera instead of walking behind it. Uh, it's a scent spray that you can put on scrapes, and uh, it draws them all the way to the scrape instead of them scent checking the scrape. Because a lot of times a buck... Uh, he might not even use a scrape, but he'll visit it right. within 50 yards just scent checking it. He'll kind of walk by at a distance. May not be in front of your camera. He could be there and yeah. you don't even know. Yeah, he could have came by four days in a row, but if he didn't come in front of your camera, you would never know that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I developed this product. 
I wanted something that was publicly legal that I could uh, put out at any time of the year that is an attractant that works really good. And I've went through countless iterations of different smells, different uh, scent delivery systems, Mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. Um, and you, it, you were talking to us about like mixing <laughs> like yeah. shampoo and, and oh, you wouldn't believe the science experiments <laughs> all that. My 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 wife thinks I'm nuts. Uh, when we were dating, uh, I was doing a lot of this experiment stuff too, and she was like, "What are you doing? <laughs> like, what is that weird smell coming out of the room?" I'm like, "Don't, don't worry about it. Don't it's, go in there. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a science, okay?" And. Uh, I, I don't know how many I tried. I tried a bunch, uh, and I'm still trying stuff, but I haven't found anything that works better than what I've already found, and I'm I'm pretty positive that it it's the it's the best thing on the market. It, I couldn't find anything for me to buy that I was confident in, enough to put out and get success with. So I just made my own, and I tried literally hundreds of combinations of things. Yeah. Well, the videos you put up and, like, the ones I've seen the last couple of days of the bucks coming in, I'm like, <laughs> what is this voodoo that he's yeah. got on these ropes that he's putting out See, this there? Is, this is Kyle's secret secret uh, kind of alternative for having you on the show, too. He's like, how can we get some branch boss? <laughs> we need some branch boss. <laughs> yeah, I know. I brought some for y'all. So, oh, oh, heck yeah, man. Man. Here, so here's the bottle right here. Uh, Dalton actually shot over the back of that buck last year. Oh, uh, that's one of that's the bucks that we got. Buck. Yeah, in Kansas on camera uh, last year using this spray. Yeah, and uh, actually Kansas banned cameras on public uh, here recently. Really? So yeah, that's a punch to the gut. Mm. But we didn't draw for Kansas, so um, so it's not going to affect me this year. But next year, I'm going to have to go around on private and try to get on the border of public. And to to try to put out some cameras because there's no way I can't run trail cameras. Yeah. I if I didn't deer hunt, I would probably still run trail cameras. You just that's, like doing it. That's how obsessed I am with that's it. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. But yeah, so th- this spray it's got uh, a combination of a lot of different things in it. Um, uh, and a deer, uh, they don't smell like a human does. Like we we smell um someone cooking, um something in the kitchen and we we get one smell yeah like, like oh it's a it's a roast or whatever yeah but then the a deer might come by and they can smell the potatoes the the carrot the the meat the every they can differentiate every scent profile and there's a lot of different scent profiles in here that are very attractive to deer and uh i've nicked some added some until i found the perfect combo and if one of the scent profiles doesn't attract them, then the other one will for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. And I've I've gotten feedback this year, which is the first year it's commercially available, uh, from people all across the country, from New York to Wisconsin to Florida mm-hmm. to Georgia, basically anywhere there's a whitetail, I've I've sent this out and I'm I'm getting good results across the board. Heck yeah, man. What is your strategy leading up to the season starting for putting out your cameras, getting pictures, and and kind of how do you think through about approaching the season? Like, where's your head at, and what are you like? I gotta go do this. this here's my checklist. So I live and breathe through trail cameras. Uh, early season is when I do a lot of the legwork on. Um, I call it casting a net for uh, for deer. Uh, and just seeing what sticks. So I will pull up on X on my phone, and if there's a certain piece of public, uh, I might circle out, you know, maybe a few hundred acres that I'm interested in, and then I will literally uh, draw a grid over the top of that and uh, try to put a camera in every little sector on that grid uh, just to cast the net. Uh, and I put my cameras in spots that make sense with compounding uh, positive features. So like um, a scrape, or if there's not a scrape, I make a mock scrape, and I put my scent on it. And then uh, if it's at um, some kind of a, a gap or a narrowing of vegetation or uh, the top of a ditch, anything that might uh, influence the travel of a deer, 
um, you can't put uh, corn piles and stuff out on public, so uh, it's a lot harder to try to predict where they're going to move and when. Uh, but if you can find a couple of terrain features um, and different things on the ground that compound, then you're going to increase your chances. Uh, so if there's – what I ideally like is putting my camera – up, uh, down, looking down a trail, pointed at a scrape, near a watering hole, at the top of a ditch, uh, in a saddle. Gotcha. Or, like, that would be ideal. Yeah. That would be an A-rating camera. You're like, check, check, check. All right, this is yeah. the spot. And, and if there's anything I can do uh, to, to increase those odds, I'm going to do it. I've even, I mean, I'm a pretty big old boy, so I can I can move some logs and stuff. I've even picked up logs and like stacked them, forced Cause the funnel. I, cause I, yeah, cause, yeah, because yeah, because I was like, man, there's only one tree this camera can go on, but they could also go behind it. And I, you know, so I've I've grunted and <laughs> moved some several <laughs> hundred pound logs. Oh, man. Just, I, I mean, I'll do whatever it takes. And that's but, in the heat of the summer, right Right before season. It's hot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But the main thing is I just go out there, try to have fun. Uh, the Ozarks don't have the expectations of uh, what you see on TV uh, in Iowa, Kansas, uh, Ohio, all those places with super big bucks. What your your goal should be is to try to find one of those respectable deer that they're out there. I, I get literally hundred or more on camera, so they're out there. And, yeah, and it's not just one public piece. Now, I'm not going to name drop public pieces, but every public piece I've got cameras in, and in every public piece I've got probably a buck over 140 yeah. on camera. Wow. Yeah, I, I I've probably got. Uh, two bucks over 140 on camera in the last three hours. I just checked my cell cams. Mm, they're texting so, you right now. Yeah, they're, <laughs> You're like, hold on. I got they're it. texting. <laughs> yeah, we got to pause the podcast. I got I to gotta look at my cameras. Uh, but yeah, cell cameras are great. They're also really cheap now, or uh, not super cheap. I'm poor, so <laughs> just coming out of law school. So, uh, And I, I get some cell cameras for free, so I shouldn't say much. But cell cameras used to be 300, 400 bucks. Now you can get a decent cell camera. Uh, like a wild game for sixty eight bucks, yeah, and um, and run those and and that really helps. Uh, you're not in there every week putting your scent down mm-hmm. and all that. Um, I just had a guy uh, training a dog on camera. Um, uh, I guess he was squirting out old blood or something yeah yeah yeah. Uh, i had it on video mode on a on a cell cam and he came through uh squirting that and i I saw him bring a dog through and stuff so there's a lot of uncontrollable variables on public but sure uh if you just start you know you can get cheap cameras and just start casting your net uh then when you finally get one picture that's all it takes Mm -hmm. one picture or video i run all mine on video if i can uh, 32 gigabyte SD cards are super cheap now, so there's no reason that it should fill up. Do you do that because you feel like you get more insights from a video, or do you do that just from the standpoint of like thinking about United and posting stuff on Instagram, or is there actually something to that? That you even if more? I didn't post, because what you see on United, I I, I cherry pick some of that in in a way that you're not even seeing the best stuff. Mm. You're not, you're not seeing the big ones. Okay. You're, seeing, <laughs> you're seeing the ones that <laughs> you're seeing the ones that I don't mind if other people find out about. I there's there's some bucks out there that they'll never grace our pages. <laughs> or if they do, I might say, "Oh, this is Kansas or whatever." Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, now uh, you know. <laughs> everybody's got to keep their secrets. I respect it. Yeah, the, the yeah, there's some secrets to be had in the Whitetail Woods, but just just know that there's some big ones out there. Sure. And you you can get them on camera. It's not it's not this mythical magical thing. Uh there's things that you can do to improve your odds. And I've been running trail cameras since I was literally like this high. Mm-hmm. Like I, I remember going to Walmart to develop pictures with the little thirty-five millimeter. Oh, way back. Like I, oh yeah, way, way, way back. Um, and then as soon as uh, you know SD card cameras came out, that's all I wanted for Christmas was more cameras. I would literally cast my net of cameras, 
find a big buck, pull the rest, and then dial in and just you wouldn't believe the the videos that I've gotten of a big bucks mm. on public. Uh, but back to your point on the video, there are so many advantages to having um, your camera set on video mode. How many times, uh, or well, I shouldn't be asking you this. I should be asking me. Sure. There, there's, I'll ask you. <laughs> how many times? Go ahead. So, <laughs> there's been so many times that I have uh, started a video and there's a doe and then I'll scroll through big monster buck behind her. If there was a minute delay, I would have never even have uh, seen the buck. I thought about yeah. that. Hey, I would have seen the picture of the doe and went, oh, cool, and scrolled through. Yeah. I never would have known that buck was there. Yeah. Also, when a buck comes in, he could trigger the camera and be facing this way uh, or come in and turn around before it triggers. Right. So you don't know if it's on picture mode. You don't know which direction he actually came from. Yeah. He could. We were just a, doing this on the on the bear site. I was trying to see like, all right, which, on video. which way are they coming in? But you don't know because they you don't get, know they come in and then they get they sit down or and they it, get turned around. It'll take it, it can take half a second and the deer turns. Yeah, and then you're like, oh, he came up from over there. No, no, he didn't. He came from another spot, but it was on picture mode, so you didn't know. Right. And there, there's also, you know, I'm, I am an official scorer for Buckmasters, so I. would I score a lot of deer, and I care a whole lot about score, but I don't even know if I know the exact score of any of the bucks I've killed because what matters most to me is age class and the sentimental mm -hmm. uh, part of having history with the deer, stuff like that. That's what gets me fired up. But I love seeing all the different angles of the buck's rack mm -hmm. so I can, I can theoretically add up uh, just yesterday I was adding up, there's a buck I call rooster. I'm trying to figure out, uh, how much he's going to score. And if it wasn't on video mode, man, you're talking about like one or two pictures trying to, trying to judge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so these are tactics that you're kind of employing to get pictures of the deer absolutely. that you want to hunt or, or videos more, more so yeah. of, of the deer you want to. I'm not after. setting this stuff up where I want to kill a deer. I'm setting it up. To where I'm compounding those features to get them on camera, and a lot of stuff is at night. But I don't care if it's 1 p.m. or 1 a.m. I just want to know that deer exists mm -hmm. because I'm after a specific caliber of deer uh, at this point in my hunting career. I I really want a really big deer, and they those really really special deer do not exist in ev on every ridge. They yeah. just don't. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm casting my net, trying to get them on camera uh, to find which one I want to go after. And if I can do anything in my power to get them in front of there, wh whether that's, you know, putting a rope out or using my scent, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever's legal mm -hmm. in my power to, to get them on camera. And then once I have them on camera, I'll make moves from there and, uh, and then set up a plan around that deer. Okay. Um, and I've kind of been burned early season uh, the past probably three years. There's there's one buck in particular that is unreal big. Mm -hmm. Like you you wouldn't even you wouldn't believe me if I showed you. But <laughs> <laughs> in the Ozarks, oh yeah, wow, oh yeah, like like almost state record ish wow. kind of buck. <laughs> and uh, I've been kind of burned on him because I put all my eggs in in, in that basket and I haven't quite figured him out. And he's on the edge near private, and I really don't want to ask permission on that private because I know he could also be on public, and I could kill him on public, but I don't want to let the private people know that, you know, there's a buck in there that I want to go after. Sure. So it's been a tricky thing. It's and a game you got to play a little you know, bit. You know, that buck, he, he, might, he, he might just disappear and fade away and nothing ever comes of it, but uh, I've, I've hunted really hard uh, – for some really big bucks, and I've killed big bucks, but um, I'm always looking for that next level, like huge caliber deer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're not everywhere here. They're they're really not, but they do exist. Now you you said something earlier, and I just want to say it before I then ask a question about trail cameras sure. before we jump into more tactics. So multi tiered, yeah. but 
the uh, the 120 inch deer you're kind of talking about you're hunting for your area that matters that's a big deer it's an older age age structure that kind of deal yeah. it's important i think as we're talking arkansas ozarks missouri ozarks just our region and you'd some said this is way earlier that you're talking about it but the the idea of this isn't kansas or it's not the midwest that yeah. kind of stuff part of the reason we even started the podcast was we know we're not there and we're trying to figure oh, out yeah. <laughs> like how to hunt it yeah, how, how to get it so how to get it figured out yeah and something colby moorhead had said a couple weeks ago that made me think of you was uh i think of this conversation as he was saying when you're bear hunting you're actually looking for kind of the caliber of bear that's going to be a good average mature bear for your area sure and yeah. so in arkansas it may not be the alaskan bruin or the yeah canada color phase Grizzly. Black bear, grizzly, you and know, that, whatever. You know, that's something and that... For the Ozarks, yeah, you're going yeah. like, man, 120-inch deer, like, that's a good deer. Like, go after it. That's awesome. If you get it, like, you've got a deer. Oh, And you're even dang. saying... 120-inch deer... Oh, totally. Uh, ...is extremely It's a great deer. Yes. And you're even saying, on public, in the Ozarks, there are deer that... At least hundreds of those, <laughs> per your trail oh, yeah. cams. Oh, yeah. <laughs> plus, much, much, much bigger deer. Which yeah. I think, the reason I'm asking is... I think the average Ozarkan in, in Arkansas, Missouri is going uh, private, maybe public. Ain't no way. Like, there's no yeah. way. Yeah. And oh, you're here to say a lot no, of people give me blank stares like, oh, you're you're not telling yeah. the truth. Or, oh, this is all from an outfitter in Kansas or whatever. No, this is Ozark. These are Ozark bucks. Okay. That exist on public. But yeah, but they're elusive, man. Yeah. No, Super I, I get elusive. that. Yeah. So to that point, trail cameras you said it takes one picture or one video that's all it takes for 22 seconds before we move on to more preseason what do you mean because <laughs> i got a lot of pictures of some deer and i don't know what to do with them <laughs> yeah they're like it's there I'm like sweet it came by at this time awesome so all it takes is one picture to know that that buck exists okay because they that the buck that i'm going after if you're getting into hunting, 120 inch deer is like, dude, you did something. Like, yeah. that is incredible. I'm at a point now to where I'm looking for the 150, 160, 170. And that deer does not exist in every block. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. In the yeah. Ozarks, it is extremely rare. So I'm looking to get just one glimpse of, of a rack that I think is that caliber. And that lets me know that at least within that three mile radius or whatever, some deer live within a mile almost their whole life. Some venture off five, six miles. But I at least know that if I put in a ton of effort within that, I'll start with a mile radius and I cast that net of cameras in there, I can figure out where that buck is living. But if I don't get the first confirmation, then I'm not, I, I'm a busy guy. Yeah, you won't put the work towards it. Yeah, it I won't sense. put the work towards it because, you know, law school, having three babies, I'm, I'm a busy dude. Yeah. So I've got, I've got to know that a buck exists mm -hmm. before I go after it. One of the problems that my dad had for a while was he would hunt Kansas and get his heart set on 160, 170. He would come to Arkansas and he's a phenomenal hunter. And he was getting on 140 inch deer on Arkansas public and not picking his bow up. And I'm like, dude, like, you, you got to hunt for where you're at. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, but I just, you know, I don't know. I really want to hit that inch mark, or whatever. And I'm like, well, well, you're not there. Yeah. You're here. You need to go to Kansas. You, <laughs> need, you need to go to Kansas if, if you need to move there. And he's probably going to move there. But he's realized now, uh, just how special those deer are so for the past th three or four seasons he's killed a 140 on yeah. on arkansas public every year that's amazing he's not passing them anymore which yeah. i'm super proud of because yeah. i had to kind of tell him you know you you can't hunt something that's not there sure you and someone that's living in the ozarks and they're wanting to deer hunt even 110 inch eight point that's that's something yeah that is that's a that's a deer, like it, that's a at least three year old buck, and uh, there's some out there that score more. You might see me or my dad or whatever shoot a bigger buck, but we're also 
pouring hundreds of hours every day of our lives. Me and my dad talk about deer hunting. So don't set that at, at, as your expectation. Yeah. You're, you should be having fun while you're doing all mm-hmm. this. And that's the most important part. And set your expectations in a in a real world and be stoked, man. If you if you kill a buck with a bow that is over a hundred inches in the Ozarks, dude, I'm I'm getting excited. I'm you know pumped up. Yeah. I I You're I'm putting a, meat I'm, in the freezer, you got an antler to put on the wall. Yeah, I'm I mean. gonna be giving you some fist pumps and stuff because that, that fires me up. Yeah. Um uh, you gotta be you gotta be content with uh, the amount of time that you actually do have to put towards it too, because it's it takes a long time to get to a point to where you're wanting to target those those bucks that might account for half of a percent of the deer population. So set your expectations in um, in accordance to where you're at. Yeah, and you're gonna have a lot more fun. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, just like my dad, he he set his expectations different, and now we just get jacked up when he when he kills one on public that's yeah. 140 yeah it really is a mindset you got to have the right mindset going into it um yeah. i think just knowing where you're at knowing what you're hunting knowing what you have if you're hunting on private and you've kind of scoped out your spot your you know your place yeah. knowing the deer that you have and that you've seen year after year you can compare and like oh man this is a really really good deer to the last couple of years we haven't had a deer like that even though it's not a 140 Absolutely. 150 even if it's a one, yeah, and then you should take 10, that deer. It's like yeah. that's yeah. the biggest one we got. That's the one we're going for. It's all about man. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And there, there's, uh, there's bucks on public that I've had history with uh, that are ten years old. Wow. That I've I've got multiple, multiple. I, I don't even know how many deer. I, I could probably sit down and count them, but that are over six years old. Mm-hmm. And I and those are the, just the ones that I can verify because I've got either a a super specific unique notch in their ear or some kind of crazy antler configuration or something that's not normal. Yeah. Uh, and I can, I can 99% verify that it's the same buck every year, same area, whatever. Uh, so a lot of these bucks are not being shot. They're, they're living, they might not grow. Uh, a lot of those six year old deer, they never make it past 130, 135 inches. Uh, I'm thinking of several eight points right now that once they get to four and a half to five and a half, they stop growing. Mm -hmm. The nutrition is just not here to produce a 170. Right. So if if you've got a buck coming in that is 135 inches and he's four years old, uh, you know, he could be a 160 someday, but from what I've seen, He's he's not going to grow much more, and you should be absolutely over the moon stoked to have an opportunity at a buck like that. Yeah, because those are the the amount of deer in the Ozarks that reach that, much less survive it, it and reach that is a very very slim amount of the deer yeah. that are here. Yeah, something that I think that just whitetail in general. It's it's cool that there's so many different ways to get excited about going after a whitetail. Some guys are like, man, this deer's not that big, but he's got a kicker, and I've always wanted to shoot a deer with a kicker. Absolutely. Or, okay, this is I know this is an old deer, and maybe he is big, maybe he's not, but like he's a six-year-old deer. That's a mature buck. I want yeah. to try to fool a mature buck. This deer, he's got this funny-looking ear, or yeah. it's a piebald deer. Like, there's so many different things that you can get excited about to get you pumped up to go sit in the tree all day and and be there when that deer walks. There, by. there are so many deer that I have I've never seen in person, but I I could tell you everything about them because I run trail cameras and I I I could talk to my wife about shamrock or dub or ditch digger or. I've I've got I'd name all my deer to differentiate them because if I didn't I there's no way I could talk to people yeah, about the different deer. deer. That one <laughs> yeah, that one ten <laughs> yeah. point over there, that one eight point with uh-huh. I get so many deer on camera I gotta name them. Yeah, sure. So, but uh, <laughs> even my wife she gets excited if I tell her, hey, I got a picture of Dub uh, or or Shamrock, and uh, those are just a couple that come to mind right now. But yeah, uh, those are both six year old deer that 
uh, I'm, I may target this year if uh, one of those super mega bucks don't Doesn't cooperate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, man, I, I've, I've a lot of my success uh, recently has been uh, late season because of m- my bar being so high early. Yeah, that it's it's almost unreachable. Mm-hmm. But I, I always want it to be kind of just out of reach yeah. just because i love deer hunting so much and i couldn't imagine tagging out early <laughs> early <laughs> that makes sense yeah. well okay let's get let's get into um some more early season stuff kind of okay. set the picture uh, when we talk early season at least in your mind because everyone might have a little bit of di- different definition for you what are you calling early season and and within the habitat and deer behavior what's going on within that time frame so early season uh, in Arkansas, they set the season right at a spot that I call the shift, which half of your bucks that you're getting on camera, you'll never see them again. Uh, they make that shift for the fall, and uh, they're getting ready for the rut. They go to their core areas. The more dominant bucks might shove uh, the less dominant bucks out. It doesn't matter how many inches of antler are on their head. I've seen... 120 inch deer knock out a 150 just by being more dominant. Uh, so half your bucks are gonna are gonna leave. Half of them are gonna stay. You're also gonna get some new bucks that got knocked out uh, coming to your area, and it's all this fluid dynamic flow of bucks uh, around the 20 20th of September. So about from right now until season starts. Yeah. Uh, That's why a lot of people get frustrated when they've been getting this buck on camera that's on a summer pattern for two or three months. And then um, right before season, he he shifts. (laughs) Yeah. But you also have the other half that stay, and that's going to be the half that uh, I key in on. uh, Those are the more dominant bucks. Well, yeah. Those are the more dominant bucks, but they're also the more predictable bucks. Okay. Uh, and I, um, you know, I have a very strong academic background, so I'm all about uh, odds and trying to um, work on information that I have. And uh, those half that stay, I uh, have the most information on. So that's the ones that I go after usually. Um, and uh, what I'm doing is... Uh, Right now, I'm in hardcore mode, shifting my cameras around, trying to figure out uh, my plan for opening day of which bucks have stayed, which have not. Um, And then I'm trying to get as close as possible to uh, the hottest white oaks that I see. Uh, Right now, the white oaks are starting to drop. Yeah. And uh, those are like literal candy to deer. Um, So I'm trying to key in on white oaks. Uh, red oaks will drop later and they stay good for longer, mm-hmm. but white oaks are the the primary attractant around yeah, here. Yeah, those get picked up first. And a lot of people, uh, I, I know my dad uh, talked about this in the other podcast, but deer are crepuscular. Yeah. So they're, they're going to have the most movement at first light and last light, but that does not mean that they bed down all day and do nothing. Deer have very small stomachs, and they have got to browse, uh, I think it's about every three hours. So they, they've hmm. got to eat constantly. Yeah, It's okay. not like me or you that can down a, a, a big Domino's pizza, and then sure. we're good for the day. Yeah, sit on you the know? couch all day, <laughs> Yeah, watch a movie. Yeah, so, so a deer has to have water. It has to have food constantly. And the deer might not move more than 150 yards, but he's going to move in daylight. Every buck moves in daylight at some point. Okay. And your goal is to get in as close as possible to him and hope that he goes a little bit further and uh, goes to one of those hot white oaks. And what's going to make him uh, switch up and go a little bit further is the most recent sign of uh what's dropping yeah okay so for right now opening day if you're looking to get on a big buck you need to look for white oaks and when you say so you're talking midday they are going to move at some point it may not be that much but they are going to move are you exclusively i think 
were you alluding you exclusively hunt evenings? Uh, early season because you're talking about trying to get in close while they're bedded down. So I'm, I, I get so fired up about deer hunting that I'll hunt <laughs> every chance I get. Okay, but evenings are definitely my favorite, um, especially early and late. Uh, if you're into late October to November, you need to be in the woods every chance you get. Mm-hmm. But early season, if you can find a good water source, prob- what's even better is if there's not a lot of water around and you find the water source that a lot of deer are using. Yeah. Because th- they've got to have water and they've got to have food. They're going to they're gonna browse around and use all the native vegetation uh, deer will eat leaves. They literally, they, they will eat a lot of different things, yeah. but if the white oaks are dropping, they are going to be in there. And, uh, if you can find one that has just started dropping, uh, and has enough volume to keep the deer in there, uh, but not so much to where, uh, doe groups are coming in and vacuuming it up, then you can find where, a buck is going to want to be or move to. Yeah. And then if you can set up on that, then you've, you've got a lot better chance uh, of having them come in there in daylight. Mm-hmm. I know um, it's probably been five or six years, but, man, I found a hot white oak, and um, I found uh, some shells that had just been cracked, and I knew that they were coming in there, but it it, it felt like every... 15 to 20 seconds I'd hear a thump thump so I was like okay this thing yeah this thing's gold yeah and I set up uh to where I'd have a 15 yard shot at that at that tree and uh I was on public so I couldn't trim shooting lanes and I had one limb that was in my way off to my right and I didn't know which direction the deer was going to come from but I thought well if he's if he's feeding around he's he's gonna give me a shot and uh, sure enough, there's this buck I call uh, Tato. Tato. I, yeah, Tato. Like potato. There, <laughs> <laughs> so th- there, this spot uh, had an old couch that someone had dumped on public. Know. And so every buck in there I uh, named after like a couch potato. Gotcha. There was one, <laughs> there was one buck that was, <laughs> I don't know how heavy. He was an Ozark buck, but. 200 and I don't know what two, 240 is huge huge like Kansas size what? and I called him couch potato uh actually missed him and <laughs> yeah, oh, no. I actually missed him Rest out of a no. ground blind <laughs> oh no uh uh but that's a whole nother story but so Tato came in uh, I could tell because he had a, a little uh claw at the end of his main beam so I knew immediately what bucket is and this would have been my first, like, super major buck. Uh, at that point, it's been, like, eight years ago or so, so uh, I hadn't killed a super major buck yet. Um, I've killed some d- good ones, but nothing like this buck. Right. And uh, I was shaking, man. He was coming in there, and uh, he came right where that limb was, uh, just almost perfectly like he, he knew – or something <laughs> that one limp Just blocking but, your shot but i also had a whole lane in front of me uh where those white oaks were that i was like okay I, like no problem he's yeah. gonna he's gonna work around you know how deer are they kind of mosey around and and walk around and stuff so he went straight to that white oak that was thumping on the ground and he ate there for probably about 10 minutes and at this point it's starting to get dark starting to get a little worried and uh i didn't want to grunt or make any sounds at this point because i knew that that would bust him out so i was just going to wait until he naturally fed in my direction into my shooting lane and uh it wasn't even like it was a a small shooting lane or anything i had i had a you know my whole vision was good except for that one limb except for that one spot and he he ate there ate there and then literally just turned and walked the same trail back out and I had zero shot the whole time. Wow. And when I say this buck got within five yards of my tree and I did not have a shot. That's I, crazy. Oh, dude. Uh, I I got back to the truck 
and I about puked. I was yeah. like, what am I doing? Especially at that point when you really hadn't killed a big one like that. You're yeah. like, that was it. Like, I mean, that was, see another yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> that was a but. I, I was already picking out the mount when I, <laughs> <laughs> I was texting your taxidermist yeah, like, hey, buddy. I was, I was shaking and I, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to have him in a full sneak. Yeah. On the, he's going to go in the living room. And, <laughs> and, no, he, everything's got to go right in bow hunting for it to be successful. And that, and that, that's one of many times that it hasn't. Yeah. And, uh, so he walked out of my life and I, 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 that's just one of the instances that fuels my passion. Right. Because if it worked out every time, it wouldn't be as fun. That's totally. right. It wouldn't. Yeah. But, we talk about that all the time. It's like, it's the difficult things. It's the challenge that makes it rewarding. If it was easy, you wouldn't love exactly. it. Exactly. And you learn everything you're out, uh, every time you're out there. So what I learned from that, uh, from that instance was when I'm going in after, um, after a buck that's on a white oak tree, I'll actually scoop some out and put it in my pocket. And if I see a buck coming in, I'll I'll drop a couple out of the tree stand to where it's thumping right under me. Oh. Or if I if I want him to be going towards a shoot, certain shooting lane or whatever, I'll wait until he's looking away and I'll kind of throw it out there. Flick one out there. Because th- they know what a thump is on the ground Yeah, uh, that's an acre, and they hear it all the time. That noise is not going to spook them. Right. Just... Toss it up and let it hit. As long as they don't see the movement and you kind of yeah, can as feel long your as movement. They're, as long as they're looking away, man, get you some acorns in your pocket and just have them ready. And if he's looking away, you can control where they go because they hear that thump. That's like a dinner bell. Mm-hmm. Ding, ding. I'm yeah. going for it. Dude, I'm so in for this strategy. Yeah, that's great. Y'all man. can't see it, it unless works. you're watching the video, but I'm sitting here smiling. I'm like, that's awesome. I never <laughs> thought about that. Yeah, one of my buddies, uh, Jonathan Moreland, he's uh, in South Arkansas uh, near the Delta, and he'll do it with persimmons. Okay. And yeah. he's, I mean, he's taking videos of does out there uh, eating around. He'll, he'll say, watch this. A drop a persimmon and then boom, does come right. Here comes they walk right. right they table. know, man. They know that sound. It's not a creak of the tree stand. It's not an unnatural whatever. They hear that acorn hit the floor, and that that's like it lights up their eyes. They're like boom. boom. Wide, wide yeah, people always yeah. say in deer hunting, it's like you never want to make a sound. And I'm always thinking like, no, no, no. You just want to make the right sound. Exactly. Like you sure. don't want a deer. Tr- you don't want a tree stand sound. Just like but when you want a deer sound. Just like when you're sound. when you're calling, dude. If I'm grunting or if I'm rattling, which I don't do a whole lot in the Ozarks unless there's a super mature buck and I know he's not coming my direction. But if I'm doing that, a lot of people they'll just bang the horns together, and or they'll just grunt. That doesn't sound like a deer. Mm-hmm. You got to thrash some limbs. You got to you know rake the tree. You got there's you got to paint a picture. It, this isn't like oh let me beat the horns together and that's all the deer hears. When that sound is going on in the wild, there are so many other sounds that I, I'll even uh, when I'm banging the antlers together, I'll even like burr, burr, ah, like that because yeah. deer make those kinds of sounds, Some crazy noises. Yeah, it, the the more realistic you can make it, uh, practice in your living room, man. No, when no one's looking, you <laughs> might look ridiculous, but you're going to sound better to the deer. I don't know how many times I've heard uh, someone, I'm hunting on public, and someone comes in on me, and I'm like, okay, whatever, and then they start rattling, and I'm like, that doesn't sound like a deer. Yeah. And they, or they'll just go, da 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 There's no pauses. There's no sequence. You think about it, a deer, they they thrash, they slip. The the sound you're hearing is is their slip mm-hmm. or their or their original connection. It's not like they're just rubbing, rubbing, rubbing. Yeah. They 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 thrash, they slip. Most of the sounds is the leaves thrashing. And then um it it's 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 not a constant. Yeah, it's, there, there's pauses, there's breaks, they get stuck together. Yeah, and the more you hunt, you're you're gonna realize that and see things that that you're like, oh, of course. Right. Uh, and I, I mean, I hunt a lot, and seeing a fight is very rare, especially in Arkansas. I've only seen maybe three or four, and I've hunted thousands of hours. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't use uh, 
rattling hardly at all. I might have used it once last year, all year. Um, and I don't carry big antlers with me. I only have a rattle bag just because I, I do it so so not so often in the Ozarks. But if I'm in Kansas, I, I've seen some I've seen some knockout drag outs. Yeah. Even from two year old deer. Like they wow. get they get after it. So it's it's cool. very effective up north. Uh, I do always bring a grunt call with me when I'm deer hunting, no matter where I'm at. Uh, and that's just because uh, one subtle little grunt to a deer that is not coming towards you uh, will get their attention. And there's there's some chance that they'll come in. Uh, it's not as effective in the Ozarks again. I don't know why Colin's not as effective, mm-hmm. uh, but I always want to have a grunt available if I need it. Yeah. But I will not call to a deer if I think he's coming to me. I, I've had way too many instances to where uh, there's passive deer, even if their antlers are big, it depends on their individual uh, kind of personality and if they want aggression or not. Mm-hmm. So will you blind call? Like if you don't see a deer and and you're just kind of trying to drum up some action, trying to see some deer, will you call? The the first week of November I will. Okay. And it will be a trotting grunt. Yeah, to something where, running. It, it's so, trailing do you got, do you maybe. got your call here? Do you want to pull out some, Yeah. I know, and we can talk gear next too and, and go into some of the stuff because I know you brought some yeah, so far we've Props. covered tra- trail cams. <laughs> I, brought, I brought some crazy stuff too. Yeah, I want to. I want to get level. into some of we've that. We've covered trail cams, food, yeah, uh, feed, water, feed features, strategies. Yeah. Uh, some feed strategies. Now we're into some calling. I so, like it. So the first week in November, I'll do some blind calling just because it's not going to hurt. They're li- it's a circus out there, dude. And if they hear a trotting grunt, that that means that there's a doe as well. And I'll bring a can call with me too. I didn't bring it with me, but uh, I actually like to do that blind more, but um, if I hadn't seen anything in a couple hours, I'll I'll break out the grunt call. If you want me to, I'll do it. Yeah, go ahead, man. I don't know if you can hear it, but... You should be able to hear some of it. So, this is actually my favorite grunt call. It, I, I tried to keep it a secret for a while, but I, I don't mind sharing it now. <laughs> it's a, a Quaker Boy Brawler, and this thing sounds so good, and it has flexibility to where it can sound like a seven-year-old buck or it can sound like a two-year-old buck Mm -hmm. and in the ozarks ideally i want to sound like a two or three-year-old buck something that the buck i'm going after doesn't mind going up against Mm -hmm. yeah so he's not intimidated by it yeah so i won't do a a buck that is just aggressive and you know i i want to paint a picture that a two-year-old buck is after a hot doe, that way that four, five, six-year-old buck says, no, 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 I'm going to come in there and steal that doe. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do a little sequence Let's like hear this. <laughs> and then I'll make some thrashing noise and stuff, and then... <laughs> Those short little bursts, every time that deer takes a step, He's continuously blowing out, but the step will make him pause. Okay. So that that sounds like a like a buck trotting after a doe. Gotcha. Okay. And you want to kind of have different inflections and stuff. And that was me pulling it in a little bit. So that sounds like a little bit of a younger buck. Yeah. But still old enough to where he's not just dilly dallying after a fawn. He's after a doe. Gotcha. So that's what I like to do, and it, it it's worked. But um, calling and, and that's when you're blind calling in in that first week of November. It, yeah, yeah. First week rut. of November. I the only thing I I won't do is just absolutely bash the antlers together. I feel like that scares more deer than it helps. But if a if a big buck hears that trotting grunt. From far away, then he he's he's gonna want to know what's going on, sure. Because mm-hmm. that paints a picture that there's there's at least two deer there, maybe more, and that means that there's a hot doe. Yeah, and he's gonna come steal her. Okay, got it. Yeah. What else do you keep in your bag? 
Let's let's get. I want to get into some of the 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 gear you got here. Let's see. Well, of course, I've got my branch boss. Of course, I, <laughs> <laughs> I will literally. I will spray this uh, in the exact spot that I want them to stop for a shot before and, you climb up in the tree. Oh yeah, and okay. it's it's worked. Okay, it's worked. Yeah, so it's designed or my intention behind the product was to get them to stop in front of my camera and instead of scent checking the mm-hmm. scrape or whatever, 30 yards behind my camera. So I will literally uh, put this and spray, 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 spray on the ground or um, or I'll even do a little drag rag. Uh, and it's not a, uh, it's not a rut scent. This is an all year scent. Okay. But for whatever reason, they just literally put their nose on it and lick it. Like they they love it. And so I'll spray it on the ground and uh, a buck will literally if he if he gets within a certain amount of yards, he'll he'll you can kind of tell he's he's wanting to know what's going on and he'll come to it and he'll put his nose in it. Yeah. I'll, sh- I'll shoot him. Man, that's cool. You're about to sell some branch boss on here. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> well, if nothing else, I'm about to use that stuff. Dude, and- so last year I made it available just through like direct messages and stuff. I, d- I didn't want to put it out if it wasn't going to work everywhere. Yeah. And so I'd, I, I shipped it out to some places all around the country and, uh, dude, I got, some good feedback yeah and so i was like yeah i'm gonna run with this and i'm gonna i'm gonna make it available so i came out with my website uh branchboss.net and it's available now there uh but i've got such a good response with it that uh i'm i've really ramped it up yeah well i'm I'm excited to try it out man too oh yeah so you've got the grunt maybe the rattle maybe not Branch boss yeah. for sure. What else are you carrying? Early season into into kind of pre rut. Uh, Picaridin. Yeah, mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the lo- the lotion. Okay, so Not the spray. That, that's even better than the thermocell. Really? Yeah, yeah. Thermocell. Uh, if you don't have it situated in the right spot, then you're still gonna get eat up. Um, thermocell works, and I use it, but the Picaridin lotion. Uh. I don't know if it has to do with me being a redhead or just I I must I must have sweet blood. I don't know. But every I like time I like how you smell, man. I could literally maybe it's the branch balls. <laughs> I don't know. No, my what whole doesn't it bring in my whole life, dude. I've been eat up by mosquitoes. If there's one person that's gonna get bit, it's gonna be me. Uh growing up, I would I get so many mosquito bites from uh playing around in shorts in the summer that uh I'd pick them and stuff, and then I'd go swim in the lake, and the and the bluegill would try to bite me. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> I get bit by mosquitoes so bad. That's the one thing about early season that I don't like yeah. is mosquitoes and uh, the heat. I can deal with because uh, I can wear some thin stuff that wicks and everything. Mm-hmm. First lights come out with some really good gear too here yeah. lately, um, but uh, yeah, mosquitoes is my biggest foe. It's not. Trying to figure out the the deer situation is trying to figure out the mosquito situation. <laughs> to get eat up. Oh yeah, that makes. You got sense. some bug spray or the mo- lotion, some bug yeah, lotion. What else? What else you rolling with? Uh, I I love having a super high quality headlamp. I use a forty kp sniper hog light um, because if I'm going in somewhere, especially a uh, semi blind. Cause I do that a lot in public. Mm-hmm. I want to be able to know like, w- where am I? Mm-hmm. And just like learning off of Tato and that experience, the shooting lanes, I want to get up in a tree that I know I'm not going to have that problem. Uh, I would rather have shots than cover. That's just my philosophy. Even being huge, like I am, I would rather have more shots than cover I do try to find cover, but shots are my priority. So uh, that headlamp that I have, it's not like you just can see what's in front of you. I can put that thing on full blast, and it's a green light, so it's not supposed to spook deer. Yeah. Uh, I I believe it because I've had deer around me, and they didn't even give it a second thought. Uh, and I've had a white light, and they've spooked. Sure. So. Yeah. I use green, 
and that thing is like super like daylight in front of you. That's cool. It it's amazing. And you can dim it down real far to where you know you're in your backpack or whatever up in the tree. Or if you're trying to figure out what limbs are 20 feet above you, you can put that sucker on full blast and know exactly what's above you. Man. So that that's been a game changer. I've been using it for uh probably four years now. And uh it saved me a lot of frustrations. Uh, getting up in a tree that uh, I really didn't want to be in once the sunlight comes up, and then I'm like, oh, I don't have any shots. Yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. I'm I'm big on quality headlamp, too. Yeah. I like what you're describing. I don't I haven't seen that um, before, but it, it makes all the difference, especially if you're going in mobile, you're on public land, you're, you're picking out a tree. Usually, yeah. if you're going in the morning, it's dark, and you're, like, just trying to guess, and you get up there, and you're like, well, crap, I, I don't like this tree at all. I wish I hadn't sat yeah. up here if you're and not plus, looking. And plus, I really don't want to say this, but I'm a little scared of the dark. <laughs> <laughs> I've had I've had moments in the dark that have been really scary. You wouldn't even believe it. There, I've There's had, not a deer hunter who's listening who's not also going to relate to that. Yeah. And if they don't, they're lying. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've I, dude, I, I used to not be, a, be afraid of the dark, but there was one time uh, on some public around here I was walking out one night and a coyote come out in the road in front of me. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool, whatever. It started walking towards me. And uh -huh. I'm like, not cool. I'm like, dang. Well, it, okay, so it's it's probably 80 yards away at this point. And I'm like, it, you know, it, it'll, it'll see me and it'll run off or whatever. That thing started running at me. No way. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, what? Like I, like I'm, I'm literally six foot three, four hundred pounds, yeah. and I'm, I'm just standing there in the middle of the trail, looking at this coyote running at me. So I put my stuff down, and I get a, uh, uh, an arrow out of my quiver, like I'm gonna use it as a shank or something. And at at this Stab point, at, at this point, the the coyote's like twenty yards away. <laughs> I'm just picturing that. Yeah, dude. I was like, I was trying to figure out either. My heart's pumping. I got adrenaline going. Yeah. I'm like, why? What is this like little forty pound dog doing? And um, so I I decide when it gets within twenty yards, and it's still like not at a full run, but it's jogging towards me. I grab that arrow and I start running at it. And that thing gets from me to you before it darts off into the woods. Oh my god! And I, my heart was beating so fast. I, 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 I called, <laughs> I called my dad and I said, "You ain't gonna believe what happened." I told him. He said, "You're, you're full of bull. That didn't happen. A coyote doesn't do that." Oh, and I'm like, "Well, it did." And I'm scared to death. So I grabbed my stuff and I was looking, I was looking back every 10 yards. And dude, well, hey, it, if, if it makes you feel any better, I about gave up deer hunting last year because I stepped on an armadillo at night. Oh, man. <laughs> jumped up. Yeah. Hey, there's I, a, I have this weird history of kicking armadillos yeah. all through college and into early adulthood. <laughs> For, for fun. Those are dumb stories. We won't tell those. Campfire this was stories. accidental. I stepped on it in the dark <laughs> and it ran out from under my feet and I was like, I'm done. <laughs> like, I can't do this anymore. Oh, that's good. Uh, dude, there's a blind armadillo that I dealt with a few years ago that was always in the trail walking in and I would hear it and it's it scared me. It, <laughs> it couldn't see or anything so it wouldn't move until I got right up on it. Yeah. And it would scare me. Oh, man. It's, uh, it's spooky hearing yeah. stuff in the dark when you can't see. Hey, two years ago, I was walking out and uh, I could hear footsteps like as I was walking and I I stopped and the footsteps, I hear, I hear like one more and it stops. And I'm like, Ooh, okay, that's a coincidence, whatever. I start walking, and I hear the footsteps again. And I pause, and I hear a ch -ch. And I'm like, no, uh -oh. come on, <laughs> come on. And so I do it a third time, and I hear the footsteps start, and I walk a little bit longer, and I keep hearing it, and it's like falling back behind me. Sounds like 15, 20 yards. And I stop again, and I hear one one. Ch and I'm like, no, no, no. not good. Uh uh, What's up? no, yeah, I don't like that. So, I uh, there it was on the edge of this real thick uh, uh, batch of cedar, so I couldn't see through it. But I threw my light on as at that point, I had the light mm -hmm. and I put that thing on and I like backpedaled and I went. Bleh! 
<laughs> what? And, and whatever it was ran away. I didn't know what it was. I went. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked out I walked out like this the whole time and my wife my wife thinks it was a mountain lion but I don't I don't think it was think it was it's, a, it's an Ozark Sasquatch I don't know what it was it was it was crazy oh I love the mating call that you did oh man <laughs> I did something un, like not natural to where it was yeah. yeah holy cow hey I've also uh, after about a two mile walk out which takes me 45 minutes or so after dark and there was these people camping right at the gate and I walked right up on them and the dude came like unglued like he saw a ghost and he pulled his gun out and put it like in my face what and he didn't know like it, as far as he knew he was camping yeah and just, just some dude with a with a bow walked up in camo <laughs> So he he like put a gun in my face and, oh my and he was like, "Oh, where'd you come from?" And I was like, "I'm I'm just deer hunting. Yeah, like, please don't shoot me." And so that was probably the scariest like real life moment I've had deer hunting was a gun in my face. Yeah, but, man. Uh, he wasn't like a bad dude or anything. He was just, He's just scared. a guy that was a little negligent that probably shouldn't have done that. But uh, but yeah, he was just scared because a, a lot of times I don't walk out with a with a headlamp on if the moon is bright enough. Yeah. And if I'm in an area that I know well enough, I just, I like to turn it off and just walk out natural. Let your eyes adjust and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I mean, I've been in the national forest turkey hunting this last year um, by myself, four days out there alone. And I was like, I mean, I had a sidearm with me and if someone would have walked up, I'd have been scared. Like, yeah. Why are you at my camp? Yeah, I don't exactly. Like it. I don't and like it. it was an hour after dark. He was like, why are you deer hunting an hour after dark? I said, Dude, you you don't know where I came from. Yeah. I I was miles back. I've been walking. And yeah, I've been walking a long time. I'm like Moses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been walking. I've been walking a long time. All but, right. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you something um, about, you know, as people go in and they're hunting early season, Yeah. what are some kind of like closing thoughts or, or tips or um, maybe some cautions to like putting a lot of time in early season or just things that you wouldn't want? someone to do so don't get burnt out it's really easy to uh hunt really hard when it first starts which i think is the hardest time in the ozarks to to kill one is when you like start a season just because of that shift and just because they're not moving a whole lot in daylight they're going to be moving three or four times times in the in daylight but it's not going to be more than 100 yards usually mm -hmm. or, or around there so don't get burnt out hunting super hard also early season the days are a lot longer yeah. uh just the daylight hours are a lot longer so it's easier to oh i'm gonna do an all-day set well that might be i don't know what is it two or three hours longer that's than long than, than if you were to do an all-day set in november and i've done that but man you talk about a drag because it might get dark at seven thirty or whatever. When in November it gets dark at like five thirty, so you you just can't burn yourself out. At the end of the day, you have got to have fun in what you're doing. And if 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 you find yourself not having fun, you you got to switch it up because you don't want this to become a chore or like oh I've got to do this or if I don't do this, what are people going to think of me or yeah. It, You've got to have fun. You've got to, I'd say the main thing that keeps me going is having a tight-knit group of guys that I can share my experience with. Mm -hmm. uh, I love sharing my experiences on social media, and that's really helped me develop uh, overall. But you need a tight-knit tight -knit group of people that you can uh, send trail cam pictures to and get pumped up about uh, – on a daily basis, I'm on a text message chain with my dad and Dalton uh, and then a couple other buddies, too, that we all just get fired up when we get a truck camera picture, and that just keeps us going. And it, yeah. and it makes us want to go out there and walk for, I think my dad put in, like, 20 miles in one day last week. No way. From, like, daylight till dark, and he, uh, he actually got a flat tire, and uh, he was, like, uh, three miles in or whatever, uh, and I I went 
and grabbed his tire, went to Walmart, got it patched, and brought it back to him while he was all day going around checking trail cameras and stuff. Uh, but he he didn't mind doing that because we get fired up. It, all it takes is that one picture, one video, right? And we it ma- it makes it. And then we we come back, we celebrate, we have fun. It's all about that camaraderie and and making it something that you can celebrate. And it might not be a 140 inch buck and it doesn't have to be right it can be uh you know going out there and killing a doe with your bow like that that's a major thing in the ozarks going out having that intimate experience celebrating when you do kill something uh even when you some meat in the freezer feeding the family absolutely and i'm okay with not killing anything I can spend hundreds of hours and and not even pick up my bow, and I'm okay with that because I've got that camaraderie with the other people and that goal that I'm working towards, and it's fun for me. When I'm checking trail cameras, I, I this is a strategy, but I will take a Bluetooth speaker and I'll blast music in the woods while I'm checking trail cameras. Really? For, for yeah, for one thing, I want the buck to hear me and spook off before he sees me and figures out what it was. This is preseason, just by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yes. Yeah, I, I'm not going to blast yes. music while other people are hunting. Sure. But because yeah, yeah. I, I don't there. Yeah, I don't want to be a nuisance to other people. But <laughs> Lil Wayne it, coming through the woods. If it's in the summer, I'll be blasting country music in my pocket, and um, and I'll, I'll be checking my trail cameras. Uh, for for one thing, I want the uh, the deer to hear me and spook off or just kind of trot off. Uh, from the sound rather than my scent or the sight, because mm-hmm. the scent or sight is going to really booger them. Uh, a lot of people are like, why are you playing music or whatever and uh, doing all that? You're going to spook the bucks away. Well, talk to me when you got over 100 120s or better on camera. And yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. So I know what I'm doing. It, <laughs> and But also because I like to have fun, and I'm out there partying. I'm literally like having Loving fun, it. sweating. Uh, that's my – best workouts is going up and down these Ozark mountains and, and just having fun, man. Yeah. It's all about having fun and you got to figure out what makes you tick. If that's going after a one sixty or something like, like it is me, then all the more power to you. But if that's, uh, getting your first deer with a bow on public, like go for that man. And we're all going to celebrate you. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love that. That mindset. It's about having fun. You can get so, uh, eat up with, with having to get the biggest deer, you know, comparing yeah. to other people you see on Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff, it's easy to forget that. No, I mean we're we're doing this to enjoy it, to be outside, yeah. enjoy God's creation, and just spend time with people who we like to spend. That's time one with. of the reasons that uh, this hat I'm wearing, the fireside hat. Uh, that's one of the reasons we did our fireside apparel because uh, it's about the lifestyle. It's not always about the inches of antler. Uh, a lot of times when you hear people get excited and talk about their hunting story, they could have killed a spike, but, but the details that they're talking about is, Oh, I opened my Dr. Pepper and it spilled all over me. And then my (laughs) buddy, uh, forgot his release and we had to go back. And it's all those little intimate details of your shared experiences with others and how that relates to your experience and, and the fellowship between people that that's what it's really all about and that the name fireside comes from uh sitting fireside talking like we are now yeah. over a campfire no matter what you're doing whether that's fishing hunting uh mountain biking anything outdoors it's about the stories and what you can get out of those experiences and what you can share with each other that's what it's all about so that's what we're trying to capture with the fireside apparel yeah. Well, it's it's true to the Ozark way too. I mean, I think the Ozarks were built around neighbors and absolutely shared common lifestyle. And I'm thankful you're from the Ozarks and, yeah. and carry that on. And I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I, it's so easy for so easy for people to want to compete with other people. And I mean, I think at the end of the day, some people want to do that. That's who they are. That's yeah. fine. They'll be on Facebook and they'll do their thing. And other people will say, you know, they'll fight back and forth. But for the average yeah. hunter, and this is just a personal story. I mean. It is. It's the fireside. It's the camaraderie. It's the story. It's yeah. the leading up to it. That's what makes the hunt. Absolutely. When I can, I shot my biggest biggest deer ever, archery season early October, and I, I remember being kind of disappointed. Not in the deer. I love the deer. Great deer, 
But my fam- my parents were on vacation. It's kind of like, you know, they're in Florida. It's like yeah. October. So it's great in Florida. And my brother was still in school. My sister was doing her thing. And all my buddies were out doing whatever they do. They weren't deer hunting at the time. And I was like, sweet. Got a deer. And yeah, I was like, missing. What now? Like the, I, You're I missing wanna, that yeah, fireside like, I wanna, experience. I want to I wanna bring it back and tell the story. And the story was calling yeah. my parents. And they're like, well, we're at the beach. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, oh, I'm, no, sure, I'm sure you would have rather uh, of... You know, no matter what the inches of antler was, you would have rather have had, you know, some people around you going out there recovering the deer, totally. high fiving, giving some hugs. Yeah, man. Man, some of some of my favorite moments. It's not about like, it's not the the biggest deer I've shot. It's not the biggest deer my dad shot. Uh, he shot one uh, in Kansas that was 186 inches. But Sheesh. but no one was there to celebrate with them, really. We, we had a FaceTime. But what I remember and the legacy is more so the buck he shot last year because I was there, he was there, my, dad, uh, my dad's dad was there, and Dalton was there. We were all there to experience that recovery. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, you talking about that's a fireside experience. That's it. Mm-hmm. Walking up to that buck, he hadn't. Walked up to it yet, and we all shared walking up to that buck, sitting around a 300-plus-pound deer with that's, he's almost 160 inches, and we were all just sitting there just in disbelief. He's He's been up there for two or three weeks, and we were all up there thinking about all the summer trips we've had together, mm-hmm. all of the, you know, the sweat, blood, tears, everything that goes into it. That is what the legacy and the fireside shared experiences are all about. Yeah. Is those moments. Absolutely. Even though the inches of antler, I mean, 160 inch deer is a giant. That's a great but, deer. But it could have been a, you know, a, a 120 or whatever. We were all there to share that experience. And that's what you got to try to find uh, to get you fired up about continuing this lifestyle. Yeah. And whatever that is for you, then go for it, man, and try new things. Don't be afraid to uh, go buy a saddle or or uh, if you've only hunted out of uh, ladder stands, go buy a lock-on mm-hmm. or, you know, hunt off the ground. Try new stuff. Get excited. Whatever pumps you up, who cares if you're, you know, you put an arrow in a deer at the end of the day. Try stuff that's going to get you excited and make you want to go out there again and again and again. Yeah. And that's what I've done with, you know, everything that I've done. I've I've tried so many crazy things, man. I've gotten in trees that's uh, smaller around in my arm. It's like a dogwood. And, dog <laughs> and that thing going like this. But, man, I had some fun. Yeah. I, I tell you what. And uh, since you can't trim limbs on public, I've actually got a scar. I don't know if you can see it in my hand. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I grabbed a limb one time and snapped it, and it went through my hand. Ooh. And so I I can still see the stitch marks in my hand. But it's stuff like that th- that I get to tell people about. That's my fireside story. Yeah. Is hey, look at my hand. It's got a big old scar in it. And it wasn't about the the buck that I saw <laughs> yeah. on that uh, or whatever. It's about a goofy story. Yeah, I don't did. even remember how many deer I saw on that trip. It was the oh, this thing happened because of, you know, this. This whatever, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love it's all it, those small little details, and mm-hmm. it's about the experience. That's that's why I, I do this year round and dive into it, because it's all those small little details that culminate up to uh, your story. Yeah. And that's what it's all about.